Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 178 of EV Musings, the podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the challenges faced by companies wanting to electrify their fleets. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that we've got episodes already planned and recorded for next season. I'll be chatting with Adrian Keane from Instavolt and look at how to drive efficiently with tips from a Guinness World Record holder. So make sure you're subscribed, or if you so wish, a patron of the show. Links are in the show notes. Our main topic of discussion today is electrifying fleets. In the world of electric vehicles, there are several classes of vehicles. We have the personal car, which is the one a lot of us have and drive around in on a regular basis. There's the large transport vehicles, such as buses, lorries, and similar. And then there's the vehicles which fall into neither or neither of these camps the vans. And in the big scheme of things, vans have a pretty unique place in road culture. As a general rule of thumb, they tend to cover large mileages. They're used all day, every day, and many of them are used on a shift basis, i.e. they might have multiple drivers throughout the day. A typical example of this goes back to my stint as a Morrison's delivery driver during lockdown. I would pick the van up at 7am, put a large number of miles on it, and return it variously between two and three. Another driver would then take it over and run it through until 9 or 10 at night. It would then sit in the depot all night and the cycle would start again the following day. Now think of the number of fleets of vans that do that. Royal Mail delivery vans, Amazon delivery vans, British gas service vans, network rail maintenance vans, and last but by no means least, national grid installation and maintenance vans. There are numerous challenges arising from this sort of fleet movement when it comes to electrification. Joining me today to talk about fleets is someone who knows more than most about the issues, challenges and benefits of electrifying them. Lorna McAteer is the head of Fleet for National Grid. I think that's right, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. I'd like to start by asking the same question that I ask everyone who comes onto the podcast, what their experience is with electric vehicles. How did you first get into this ever-expanding niche? Oh, what a great question. I think I got asked that once before by Mark Goodyear. So the story that I tell everybody is the first electric vehicle that I ever drove was a Peugeot Ion van. And we were taking it back to the dealership and I'd got my boss in the vehicle and it was the first time I'd ever driven an automatic vehicle. So I practically put his head through the windscreen at the first stop that we came to. (laughs) Fantastic. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about National Grid. Can I get some sort of fleet statistics? How many vehicles in the fleet? How many are you electrifying? How many have you already uh, put through the process? What's the mix of quote-unquote normal vans versus larger vans versus four-wheel drive, etc.? No, that's fine. And the challenge I've got in giving you that answer is we acquired Western Power not so long ago. So actually the fleet makeup in the UK is changing. So all the numbers have changed quite a bit. But in total, there's roughly 9,000 vehicles. That includes some plant, that includes the HGVs. We have 1,200 four-by-fours, give or take. And we have three and a half, 4,000 panel vans. And then we've got the HGV in the plant. And between both of those in the UK, we've got two and a half thousand cars. So when it comes to the numbers that are electrified, when it comes to cars, we've probably got about 1,000 vehicles now between the two. So I know on fleet I was managing before the, the the acquisition, we had 734 pure electric vehicles, which was almost halfway through our car fleet. We're working our way through it. We've only got 200 ICE vehicles left that I need to shift, but they're on natural replacement cycles. So when they come up, they'll be changed. Fantastic. Now, a lot of people think that electrifying a fleet is simply a case of well, replace all the old petrol or diesel vans with an electric version, stick a charger in the depot, and you're done. How accurate is that? I would love for it to be that accurate and that easy. I think if it was, then my life, my job would be done. It's never that simple, is it, Gary? It's a real challenge when you come there. And I think a lot of that, if we put some context behind commercial vehicles, 
They've always been the poor relationship in any company. So when I was at Royal Mail with the largest commercial fleet in the UK, it was still not priority compared to the actual post is delivering out there. So vehicles are always down the peck in order in terms of priority. And when you take that through the years and all the cost challenges that come up, the legislation challenges and everything that goes, that goes into it, then what you find is fans have been utilised more and more and more. You change drivers, but the vehicle doesn't necessarily change. You push things down as much as you can to make the most out of that asset that you have. So when you then come to a different technology, you have to review everything that you've already had in place. Some things remain the same. They, they are simply the same things. You still do your daily checks that you would in any other kind of vehicle. You still get out there. You still look at your processes. But some of the things that have shifted are you used to have depots and vehicles might go into depots. You might, over the last few years, move to home working. You may have changed that whole operational piece. So what you have now is no longer just a like-for-like like change especially when you come into the utility area that I'm in, because your vehicles on that commercial side are your workshops. They're your mobile units that carry all your kit. So they go out fully laden and they come back fully laden. They may have generators on them. They may have bits of kit that you need to power at the same time. So how do you look at all of that now that you're looking at vehicles that have more weight and less range? And are you being able to sort of source the vehicles that you need that will allow you to sort of use them as mobile workshops? I mean, what, what's the market like for that kind of fleet van? So the market is still changing and it's still learning and it's no different to how it's always been. So by that, I mean, cars will come first because it's easiest and you can go retail and you make more money out of it. So you use that development. The trucks will come next because your development tends to go into trucks. And then the vans in the middle tend to be the ones that if they're on the same chassis as a car, then they'll be developed. If they're on the same chassis as a truck, then they'll be developed. And everything else kind of fits in the middle somewhere. So it depends on that entire market space as to how far they are. So when I put my strategy to get together back in, oh, January 2020, I gave myself 10 years. Um, I looked at my vehicles what the life cycle of those vehicles currently were, what vehicles were available in the marketplace that year and in the next year. And then I based all my recycle changes to coincide with what I knew I could already get. I didn't worry about my four by fours, for example, because there is no solution to those right now. But that solution will come before we get to 2030. So it was planning it all in. So going back to your basic question of, are there enough fans around at the moment? No. Are they coming? Yes. Will they start to do the job I need them to do? Most of them will. Will the others cause me challenges? Yes. And that's where we start to look at how we have to change from the top down in an organization on the work that we do to carry out the same kind of jobs that we're used to doing. I don't know whether I misunderstood this because we've chatted before, but am I right in thinking that the, you know, when, the, when you put the plan together, cost wasn't necessarily a driver for going electric? Is that right? So where you got that from, when I did the cars to start with and was on a um, recent webinar about the cost of it, cars were a no-brainer, so it absolutely made sense to do. When it comes to the commercial vehicles, you have to take yourselves back to basics. What is the driver for your business? What is your motivation behind doing this? And therefore, what is it that's really pushing you to make the change? And for us and myself, it was air quality piece. It's about making the environment we're in much better. And as National Grid, of course, we want to be at the heart of that energy transition. So for us, it's not just about the cost of those vehicles. Having said that, the early vans that we did, the costings we looked at, the um, lower maintenance side of things, it did still cost in for us, but it's a challenge. As the vehicles get more complex, then the capital outlay really does start to eat into it. But it's no longer now for us anything to do with the costs. We're not going backwards. We are not going to change our mind and start doing anything else. That's not to say I'm going to put anything, no matter what the cost of it is. There's always a cost element that has to go in this. But this is about what is the price you pay for air quality. What's the mix of 
drivers you've currently got who can charge at home versus those who'll need to use some sort of depot or public charging? An interesting question because I haven't given ho- any home charges to anybody, whether they're commercial vehicles or company car users. Um, a lot of that was down to the equity piece because if you've got similar people doing exactly the same job, but one has a driver, and one's in a block of flats, how can you differentiate and make that work? And at the time we were looking at this, there weren't enough solutions. So the answer was don't give anything to anyone. We'll help support in their own personal claims or looking at other ways to do things, but we weren't actually going to provide charge points, especially as you have people that move house a lot as well. So how do you balance that one out? It's not as like a laptop where you can give them the laptop and then when they move or leave the company or do something, it goes with them or you take it back. It's much harder to do with a charge point. So we looked at everything we had. We looked at the environment where we, we were in. We looked at what depot charges we could put into small commercial vehicles. And then we just looked at the public infrastructure and it is there. It is there to support people. And we just tapped in at the time, and piggy banked on the fuel card that we got and asked them if they could do an electric version. So we did that. And then we started exploring as technology moves, as the innovators come out, we look at what all the alternative ideas are. And the other reason I haven't worried too much about the home charging is, as with all fleets, the advice I give them is go with your low-hanging fruit. Pick the ones that you can do. Pick the easy-to-do ones because you will be on that journey. and You'll start making that change. Difficult ones come later. And when you get to those difficult ones, you've got enough lesson from the easy ones that you can understand what some of your solutions need to be. That makes a lot of sense. I don't know whether we sort of skipped over that bit, but do you actually have charge points that you've installed at any specific locations, uh, not not your home, but sort of depots or that sort of thing? We do, and we have a whole plan. So um, Western Power, when we acquired them, interestingly, they have a slightly different strategy to us. And the difference in that strategy is the vehicles that they had went into depots, picked up their work, and then came out again. So they needed a quick turnaround. So the charges that go in there are 50 kilowatts. Whereas the ones we've got in our depots and we're gradually putting in are mainly at the substations because the engineers are traveling to those substations and then they're generally working there all day. So we could put in seven kilowatt or 22 kilowatt charges in those locations. So what we were looking at in both of those strategies is making sure we had the right charger in the depot for the right job that goes with that vehicle. So what we weren't doing is just putting in rapids because it seemed the right thing to do. We made sure it was the right charger at the right speeds. So it's basically destination charging and workplace charging all wrapped up in the same thing. Now, you and I were in a meeting recently and the topic of electrifying fleets came up and some of the items that we discussed well, you discussed, I was listening and making notes most of the time, were ones that I would never really have thought about as problems. Let's go through a couple of them and, and sort of get your view on them. Height restrictions, why is that a problem? So these are the things that I think when you're one of the early adopters, you look at the small panel vans and you think, yeah, that's great. And it's like everything, isn't it? It's that positive reinforcement piece. You never notice it until you've done it or you've had a look at it and then suddenly you see it everywhere. And what I mean by that, so I drove the high reef electric transit all the way down from John O'Groats to Land's End as part of Greenfleet's EV rally. And I deliberately chose to do that because it's a vehicle we needed to test. And I wanted to see what the challenges were. And even I hadn't noticed how many height restrictions are on car parks. And the challenge that presents is the people that are putting the charge points in are generally putting them into these car parks with the intention of servicing cars. When you then get a high roof van, you can't get it in there. And even if you're, and it, it, when you do that, it makes you realize that actually you've got cars that have bikes on roof racks that are going on holiday that then can't get into those car parks either. You've got people with roof boxes on, you've got people towing horse boxes, and you start to look at all the other different types of usage that goes with vehicles. And you realize height is a problem, underground car parks are a problem. Even some really tight pens as these vehicles get slightly wider because of all the safety feature on them, that's a problem. If you then go into towing, you've got your cars towing your caravans on holiday. 
you've got your utility vehicles towing their generators, you've got people towing horse boxes. There are all sorts of things that when you look at it, people use things for very different reasons. And when you're towing, especially as well, when you get to one of those charges, the last thing you're going to do is try and unhitch in a really busy car park to put whatever item it is you're towing somewhere else to then drive into the charge point location or reverse into it wherever your charge point is to do a bit of a top up to carry on your journey. And these are the things that actually now we've moved out of niche and early adopt. Sorry, now we've moved out of early adopters. We're moving into niche and mass market. And we're starting to have to look at all the other things that are going to crop up. And they're not easy solutions. But by highlighting them now, which is the reason we were chatting about it the other week, is the more we can highlight it, I'm not asking for people to go and undo what they've already done. What I'm asking people to do and planners and builders and anyone putting things in is actually, if you put another bay over this side of the car park, you could do this instead. So it's just making people aware of what else is coming, because if we don't do that now, we won't be able to transition everybody. And I think that's key because one of the other things we talked about was location of charge points. And I think by that, you've already touched a little bit on that. Sam Clark was in the room from, from GridServe and you know he's conscious of the fact that if you take away the uh, electric forecourt in uh, Braintree, every single GridServe site at the moment falls under what you've just said there, where if you're towing something or you're in a, you know, a particularly large vehicle, you've got to unhitch whatever's at the back and either drive in or, or, or reverse in. There's very few sites that are set up for the, um, you know, the drive through kind of charging, which is something we're all used to with, with petrol, because just about every petrol station is drive through. It doesn't matter whether you're towing something or not, whether you're at the left or the right, you just drive in and it's, it's not a problem. So, how do you see that progressing? Is that something that will become mainstream or are you going to have to fight to get that for some of the, the fleets and the larger uh, vehicles? So I think it will start to come in because you've mentioned GridServe there and the work that Sam's doing. They are already doing that with a lot of their forecourts. So when they're designing the forecourts from scratch, they are making sure they look at future proofing and additional facilities. So their Norwich one, for example, as well, also caters for coaches and trucks. So they've made sure they've got the length, depth, height of all of those base to allow the different types of vehicles coming through. I think we'll probably see a few more designated commercial vehicle places. I think you're right that the fuel stations, we've got so used to that drive in, drive out. Nobody bats an eyelid if a vehicle is towing and takes up two pumps to start with because they'll be in and out quite quickly. I think it's very different now with electric. And what we've got is it's just the early adoption of stuff because it's been easy to put things in car parks and it's just symptomatic of how it's been rolling out. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's just making sure that it does change for all of these other vehicles that we use. But of course, a lot of the people that are putting that stuff in don't drive these commercial vehicles, so they don't understand because they've never seen it. It goes back to that point I made earlier of once you know about it, you actually spot it a lot more. Are we sure about Norwich being allowing drive-in or drive-through kind of uh charging because i thought it all it was all in under the overhead thing there wasn't it yeah they've got they've got a beautiful picture of a coach in there have they i'm looking at the website now i can't see never mind <laughs> never mind i think the point i was making is grid server at least are looking at this and they are trying to develop their stuff to make sure it is future proofing for the other types of vehicles that are out there and they're not the only ones some of the others are actually looking at how they can make things with higher roofs um, that they've got more accessible bays for people because it's looking at the mobility side of things as well as the trucks. So when I say mobility, people in the wheelchairs as well. So what you've got, and again, if you take one of the other, the Weatherby site, I believe it is, there's some accessible bays. Um, so they're making sure that they're doing, they're thinking these things through. Even if it's not all right today, at least these companies are looking at what can be done for the future. Talk to me about van taxation because that was another thing that came up, wasn't it, in the discussion? So what we were discussing on van taxation, there's a lot of things around the personal use of the vehicles. There's the taxation and how it's going to be going forward. So I think what we've got with taxation is there's all the elements within tax of a corporate of how it's coming through and how you look at those vehicles and use them. The write-down allowances, 
the whole um, grants that go with it and everything else. You've then got the personal elements for those corporates that allow those people to drive those vehicles um, for personal use as well. So it's still an interesting element where not everybody fully understands it yet. And I say that because I've been involved in a lot of consultation papers with government and other bodies. They are looking at it. They are acutely aware of everything and they are trying to make it so that it's practical and cost effective for companies to use. But it's just one of those things that as you're looking at vans, you just need to bear in mind some of the other elements of it. Talk to me about induction charging. I know our friend Sam Clark doesn't like it, but I'm talking with um, Hevo, the induction charging manufacturers, uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And I'd like your thoughts on that, please. So for me, I mean, I always used to have this mantra in fleet of right vehicle, right job. That got extended to right vehicle, right job, right fuel time, right, right fuel type, right time. And now I'm also kind of saying it's the same when it comes to chargers. You need the right charger in the right location and of the right type. There's nothing wrong with induction charging. And where I see the likes of induction charging having a really vital part to play, if you imagine you're going down that motorway and you see all those police patrol vehicles or the Highways England vehicles on the side of the motorway, why can't they have a little induction pad that's solar powered that means that when they stop, they're actually gently charging their vehicle so that when they have to go back on that motorway, they don't have to stop, go and unplug something and then plug it in again. You've got induction charging that works really well at taxi ranks. So if you think about it, you're at a train station, your taxis are coming in, they're all queuing. Well, why can't they queue and keep moving down an induction pad, which means they don't have to get out and get in their vehicle each time to make it charge? And so it's those kind of use cases that I think induction has a really vital part to play. You go to a ferry port. There's limited capacity at ferry ports, but you've got this captive audience of people sitting there that can't charge when they're on the ferry because the ferry needs all the power it can get. But actually, you're in all of those bays. Why can't you make those induction charging for some of those bays? I'm, I mean, I'm nodding furiously here as you're, you're saying <laughs> that. Is there? Um, I mean, you talked earlier about some of your guys going out. They spend all day at uh, you know maybe one of the substations working on there. Is there a use case within National Grid to actually have induction charging? at places like that? I can't actually see a use case for any of the national grid vehicles for wireless charging because if they're out of the vehicle, they're working in that vehicle or it's plugged in. So I can't actually see a need where the reason you have those use cases is because the vehicles are moving or they're captive in a place and the induction works because you don't have to get out and plug it in and and take it out again. But I think All of the vehicles we've got and how we would use them, I can't actually see us needing that. That's fair enough. Now, I mean, we've covered quite a few different topics uh, already on the discussion, but what's what's something about running a fleet or an electrified fleet that people don't necessarily understand or appreciate and will probably go, oh, really, if you told them? I think there's lots of things. We've already touched on all the nuances, haven't we, with a load of the vans. I think one of the things everyone forgets is every single driver is different and it can always be really, really emotive. So when you're looking at things like that, and we touched on induction charging, so actually we're still doing studies and we've got interesting things with drivers. We've got a couple of drivers with pacemakers. So what could we do? How did we manage that? What are the safety implications of it? Whilst they could be in the vehicle, because that's like its own little Faraday cage, that's fine. But actually, if they go near a rapid charger, is it safe to use the rapid charger? If there's magnets anywhere, you know, how does all of this work? So one of the things I've had to become as a fleet manager, I've had to learn all sorts of things I never thought I'd ever learn. But it's the driver's side of it. And it's that uniqueness of each of them. As we go from what is usually seen as quite simple, here's a few fans, off you go. It becomes really complex especially when your fuel type is different now because you've got people with prepayment meters at home. Their circumstances are very different. And even if you're as a company paying for all of that, how do you balance the fact that the electricity company in a surge in electric and gone, right, we need to up your tariffs? Even if you're not on a prepayment meter and they've suddenly increased your direct debit because you're using more electricity, even if the company is paying for it, how do you square that one off if the employee can't afford it in the first place? So what you're moving into now is those differences. 
and they're the challenging, harder to do bits. There are solutions out there. It, they just take time now to understand it, learn about it, and make sure that you keep people safe. Because the one thing as a fleet manager, utmost at the front, is you don't hurt anyone. So you always have to make sure that you've got that driver's interest. Which is interesting because one of the topics that Kate, that I made a note on from our discussion last week was avoiding corporate manslaughter. And I think that's pretty much what you've been talking about there, isn't it? It is. And I, I think you're coming to that because both James Rooney and I were there talking. And it is, as a fleet manager, that is the first, one of the first things you have to look at. So it's all about the compliance. And a lot of people forget that the bigger your vehicles are, depending on the work you do, you end up into O-licensed territory as well. So you have to have tachographs and you have all sorts of other things that you need to do. So it changes how you look at things, but you are always looking at, I need to keep the driver safe and I need to make sure we don't hurt anybody else as well. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, What is the question that I haven't asked you that you probably would have liked me to ask you? (laughs) Oh, crikey. Um, I'm so used to people saying to me, can the grid cope? And the answer is always yes. So that's not one. Oh, we know that because we've had Graham on the show and he said that. Uh, any, uh, I know. Any and then every time we talk out there and what's really great for me is I listen to other, um, stand there and look at other people on stages now and they answer the question for me. I don't have to answer it anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure if there is one. I think people sometimes ask me, are government doing enough? And that's an interesting challenge because I think it's the most joined up I've ever seen them as a government. I think there's a lot they're trying to do. And they're trying to do it without all the unintended consequences coming back and then having to unpit things. So as much as I want them to move faster, I actually think they're going at a reasonable pace for what they can manage. I often get asked, "Do I? would I be using hydrogen instead? And again, that's another interesting question. I think hydrogen has its place in vehicles in the same way different induction charging has its place. It's down to use case of vehicles. And again, when you look at health implications or usage implications, you know, an ambulance to me, and the ambulance service can say differently, but I think ambulances are probably where you might have more use of hydrogen than you would of an electric. In some cases, not all. Interesting. All right. Final question now. King for a day. What would you do? Sorry, queen for a day. What would be the one thing you would do immediately to make somebody in your position's job easier? Make sure all the execs at the top understand the challenges that the fleet manager has. I like that answer. I like that. Okay. I think that's just about all I want to chat to you about today. Thank you very much for your time, Lorna. Much appreciated. Very welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. A couple of takeaways from this. First of all, Lorna mentions charging a bus at GridServe in Norwich. I checked with GridServe and all their bays are nose-in or rear-in bays at that site. This means that you can't actually charge in the same way as you do with a petrol pump, where you park alongside the pump regardless of how long your electric vehicle is. However, Lorna is quite right that you can charge a bus at the electric forecourt in Norwich. The bays are tall enough and long enough to allow a bus or other long, tall vehicle under the building to charge without locking anything. Lorna also mentions James Rooney in this conversation. James is the head of road fleet for Network Rail and has a similar job to Lorna in a completely different market segment, public transport. Fleet electrification has a number of challenges that other fleet work doesn't. Lorna mentioned things such as finding charges that can handle vehicles towing trailers and how do you deal with people who have pacemakers and the electromagnetic fields that are created while charging. The charging issue wallet also extends to How can we pay for this? If you're charging your fleet van at home on a prepayment meter, that's a different proposition to charging it in public at, say, a local seven kilowatt charger, which is different to charging it off-road on your driveway using solar or cheap off-peak electricity. Luckily for a number of van drivers at National Grid, the fact that they spend a lot of time working next to an electric substation means that a charger can be added there, which keeps the van topped up throughout the day. But this isn't a universal thing for all fleets. The whole area of fleet electrification is something that I think is very misunderstood by lots of people. The whole replace the current vans with electric ones and stick a few charges at the depot is certainly a very extreme edge case. I really enjoyed the chat with Lorna, despite a mid-discussion interruption caused by a thunderstorm, which drowned out all conversation. Thanks for your time, Lorna. Much appreciated.
it's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. Although electric cars catch fire far less than the fossil fuel equivalents, a recent report put the differential at 1900%. When they do catch fire, there's no real way to put them out quickly. Or at least there wasn't until now. A York-based company called ProSpeed Motorsport has designed and built a fire engine that can extinguish EV battery fires quicker and more effectively than all current models. The Highland 6x6 Rapid Intervention Vehicle is short, is short enough to enter multi-storey car parks, both over and underground. It can carry crew, water and innovative fire extinguishing equipment. And it's fitted with the innovative Cobra Cold Cut System for extinguishing EV battery fires. The Cobra Ultra High Pressure Lance System uses an abrasive suspended in water to pierce a hole through floor pans and inject water at 300 bar, more than 100 times the pressure of the air in a typical car tyre, throughout the module casing. This water cools directly inside the battery and thus prevents propagation and further possibility of a thermal runaway. It also does this with less than the amount of water used in a bathtub. One unit can carry enough water to deal with four battery fires. Although designed and built in York, it's currently being tested in the Czech Republic. Very nice. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapman, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Zapmap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using Zapmap in car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at Musings EV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings EV or on LinkedIn, if that's where you found this episode, with the words, right vehicle, right charger, right place, right time. Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know, he's having trouble par- parking his Model Y since they removed the parking sensors and radar and relied on cameras only. I told him Tesla should be able to park using the force and stop on a pinhead. He told me, I would love for it to be that accurate and that easy. Thanks for listening. Bye.